Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to this round table on artificial intelligence and international cooperation. My name is Nico Heller and this is Reboot 2030, the Democracy School's YouTube channel and podcast. In this Reboot special, we talk about the strengths and limitations of current AI, why AI might become a dangerous instrument of disinformation, and why super intelligent AI may be much closer than most people previously expected. In other words, why it may only be years rather than decades away. Leading on from that, we argue that this motivates the need for international cooperation and to avoid, for example, catastrophic risks arising from AI arms races or indeed from economic race driven by a similar self-destructive game theoretical competition. With me today are Giorgio Bencio, Professor of Learning Algorithms and Artificial Intelligence in the Department of Computing and Operations Research at the University of Montreal. And John Bunzel, founder and trustee of the International Simultaneous Policy Organization, or SIMPOL for short. Let me invite uh, the two in. Hello, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining me today. Can can you all hear me? I do now. Yes. You can hear me. I have already very briefly introduced you, so uh, let's jump straight in. Joshua, um, thank you ever so much for being here today. It's, it's a great privilege and you have been in the news a lot. You have been quite vocal about the risks of, of uh, current uh, artificial intelligence. Now, it's interesting when when I hear somebody like you coming out quite, you know, with warning signs of of the type that you've come out with. It kind of, in a way, reminds me of Albert Einstein. You know, uh, you know, he he was of course a very gifted scientist who was involved in the first atomic bomb, and once it was there, um, he became a a great critic. Uh, of uh, 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 nuclear uh, nuclear arms, and there's a sort of a, a poetic similar, similarity here. You've been really one of the very early pioneers of artificial intelligence, and here you are, um, sort of sounding uh, a warning signs. So, um, you know, what, what do you think are the kind of the the, the real risks? Uh, you know, uh, it, that, that you see emerge in the absence of adequate regulation. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Well, uh, in summary, there's a whole continuum of risks, and there's a lot of about the scenarios uh, that could turn bad that we don't understand and that have a lot of uncertainty attached to them. Uh, which also explains why there's a lot of divergence in, in the AI scientific community about um, these questions. So let's let me try to um, break down different kinds of um, catastrophic scenarios because this is where the international community really needs to uh, be present um, because there are like sort of simpler harms. Okay, so first is and um, easiest to understand is misuse where um, humans, uh, some organizations, some people intentionally use very powerful AI, which doesn't even need to be superhuman um, in order to achieve something very dangerous. So once, once we have AI systems that can be, say, comparable or better than us in terms of uh, cyber uh, security, for example, um, you can immediately see that they're like huge dangers. Um, but there are other areas that you know I've been worried about and others too. I've been working for the last few years a lot on biotechnology, I mean AI for biotechnology, and it's very clear to me that this is a, a very, very dangerous area um, because um, we're making progress in understanding how we can um, change the DNA of, of uh, microorganisms so that they would do something that we want but that can easily be turned into something dangerous. And for now, we don't yet you know, have enough understanding of, of that. Uh, biologists only have partial views, but it could change quickly in the coming years. And AI is 
going to help us in that respect. And a lot of the data is, is publicly online. It's very easy to order, uh, you know, pathogens. I mean, they don't may not look like pathogens, but, you know, yeast or bacteria and, and order uh, variants of them that have DNA changed in any way you want. And the companies who will do that will not know what that change means. So, so that's uh, bioweapons. And then people have been also talking about uh, chemical weapons. Again, uh, we're using AI to design new drugs, for example. I've been involved in this. But it's easy to change the objective into something nefarious. So uh, then um, I'll explain later like how an AI could potentially uh, get access to all this. But for now, uh, these are uh, examples where um, Again, going back to what I'm saying, we're talking about humans intentionally using powerful AI systems as let's, essentially as a weapon. Yes, let's backtrack a little bit. Let's backtrack yes. a little bit because I'm, I'm I have a sense that many of our viewers or listeners have not really a very clear idea in mind what AI actually is today. Oh, uh, sure. I, I think it's a highly mythologized term. Um, yes. And I, I instantly think of, you know, science fiction. I think of some virtual brain kind of talking back to me out of cyberspace. Um, what is the current state of AI? What is it, you know, what can it do today um, realistically? And what is the trajectory? I mean, how would you see it develop um, yes. over the okay, next year? Sure, I can, so I can answer that. Also, I guess there's when different forms of AI. I mean, when people now talk about AI, they presumably talk about large language models, I think, because chat GDP has been so dominant in public uh, discourse. Let's, 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 I think let's that's what most people have. Large so again, deep nets. Large deep nets, because you also have uh, models of images, both for recognition and for synthesis. Um, speech, uh, like sounds, music. Um, both, uh, you know, and recognition. So we, we now have machines that can perceive the world and make sense of it with images and sounds um, and can also generate content, uh, uh, images, sounds, and texts. Um, so all of these systems uh, are based on deep learning, which is uh, inspired by how the brain works. And you got like um, a, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of uh, connections between artificial neurons, or even a trillion probably in GPT-4. So these are huge systems. And they're Training is extremely expensive right now, but the cost is decreasing quickly. And once you have trained a system that essentially builds an understanding of the environment in which it's trained, like the kind of data. So if it's text, it will understand the world through that angle. If it's text and images, it will understand both these uh, sort of uh, modalities. Uh, but you could have video and then and text. So then it, it understands all three sounds and images and text. Um, so these systems, once they're trained with, which takes months and tens of millions of dollars, uh, they can be tuned for specific tasks. And that's how like the dialogue systems like ChatGPT have been designed. And it doesn't take that much time, uh, that much money, and that much data, which means that second part is fairly easy once you have access to the pre-trained model, which is like a huge file, um, but you know, not, not so big. Um, so for example, when Facebook is sharing the weights of their large language models, I think they're playing with fire. Now the current systems are not yet at the level of human intelligence in many ways, but most importantly, like, well, the general agreement, let's say is they master what psychologists call system one um, intelligence, and that's essentially intuition, like your reactive answer to any context and uh, question without really going through an internal thinking step. Um, and so they're not that great in terms of reasoning tasks, but they can do some reasoning, like, you know, you don't need to think through for things you're familiar with you. It looks like your reason, but, but you know, you've learned to 
combining pieces of evidence in order to come up with answers. But, but system two is where you have explicit reasoning and um, you're, you know, that allows us to generalize in new contexts better than machines right now um, to imagine things in order to help us plan and things like that. So there's still a gap. Could you could I ask uh, you to give me an example, a decision, like a decision challenge where, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, AI 0.1 and AI 2.0 uh, that you've just described, right. how they differ. Give us a simple yes. decision, a, a decision problem and show the difference. Right. Uh, so right now, if, if you give an AI a few simple rules, like some arithmetic rules. In fact, it already knows them because it has read a lot about it in the on the internet. Uh, if you ask it to do simple operations with uh, numbers, it will get them right. But if you start asking complicated operations of the kind that you and I would need paper and pencil or a very good uh, ability to visualize things, uh, but clearly using our thinking process, uh, it wouldn't do that great. And it would make mistakes. And then if you ask it uh, to explain its wrong answers or even the right answer, it, it tends to give a, a, a wrong explanation. So, so when you have a chain of uh, like thoughts that are necessary for us humans to solve the problem, and it's a new chain, so it, it's not something it has seen, um, then it, it, it will tend to make more mistakes. Sometimes it'll be okay, sometimes not. Um, so, so, so that's an example of reasoning there, but there are other things like an example I gave in my talk, which is they will need a lot more data to adapt to a new situation. Whereas we can use our thinking to kind of train ourselves in our mind. So the example I use is if you've been driving all your life in uh, North America, uh, driving on the right side of the road, then you go to Australia or London and you have to drive on the left side. Um, it's going to take humans, um, you know, an hour of driving more or less to kind of get it right. And in that hour, they will survive because they will be thinking very carefully about each move, right? Which means you don't go with your intuition default behavior. You have some part of your brain that's checking, oh, no, 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 you need to go this way. Or you need to anticipate other cars, you know, because the rules are different. And it's just, just one rule that's changed, but we can like very quickly, even, even in our minds, we can do a lot of the training to get better at it to some extent. And athletes, for example, do that. Anyways, um, so, so there are a number of these abilities that uh, are still missing, but the concern I have and others have is that um, we don't know how much time it's going to take to bridge that gap. Um, I've been working on this problem, the system two problem for like six years, and we could be very close to a breakthrough. It's very plausible, or it could take another 10 or 20 years. I don't know. There's like science is unpredictable in, the, in, the, in the, you know, these things. There, there, there's but we one are aspect. understanding enough that it could be pretty close anytime there, there, now. There's, there's one aspect which I would like our viewers to understand a little bit better. And that's you said to say the AI needs to be trained on data. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, that, 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 again, the, there's this kind of idea, almost like a muscle sort of thing, you know, like training, like yes. going to the gym. It's just but, like us. Yeah. But the thing is, of course, is, is that data has inherent biases. So sure. we're not only training the data in a kind of, Aristotelian kind of way of pure thought, but the training data on a very, on a very realistic set right. of, you know, and it includes anything from homophobic kind of data to right. racist That's data right. to, you know, kind of populist yes. nationalist data and so on and so forth. So I guess part of the process of training is also cleaning the data, isn't it? So that so that the data that actually is then be used for well, the that's training is actually just, done by humans. I mean, writing specialized scripts and asking labelers like cheap labor to kind of identify cases of uh, you know racism or um, things like that or insulting behavior or whatever um, or providing information that could be dangerous like you know how to build a bomb yeah 
And, and oh, so, so my right question now, there's, is, there's, yeah. My question is, is if we were to kind of jump to super intelligent AI, yes. would the AI then be able to iron out these biases itself, or in, in your thinking, or would it just sort of turbocharge these biases? Where you know, what's the? Well, it depends. It depends. It depends what kind of approach you take to bridging that gap. The approach I'm working on, I mean, or have been, um, wouldn't hopefully have this problem because instead of trying to imitate how humans behave, it would try to understand why they behave that way. It would build a causal model, just like we do, by the way. So it's not because I hear somebody say something like outrageous that I suddenly believe it, right? I take into context that it's this person saying it and or sometimes humans lie or have intentions to deceive or whatever um, or are so simply wrong. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think it's quite possible that we could fix this and, 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 and I think it will be necessary actually to fix this uh, in order to build systems that actually understand how the world works and that's where they get most dangerous, right? So we'll fix the bias problem but we'll now have machines that are like at least as smart as us. And by the way, there's an interesting thing that uh, has been explained nicely by my um, colleague and my co-award winner, Jeff Hinton, in a recent talk. Um, once we have machines that are as smart as us, in the sense, I mean, as sense, no, once we have machines that um, uh, embody the principles like system one and system two that, you know, essentially give us our cognitive abilities, we'll automatically have machines that are smarter than us. And that's because these programs are running on digital computers and we are running on biological uh, analog hardware. And there are like, so to, to, to try to make images to understand the difference. For example, uh, these machines are essentially immortal. They can copy themselves into other computers. You, if your body fails, you know, your brain dies, you're done. Um, these machines don't have those limitations. Also, they can exchange information between each other at a rate like billions of times greater than us. We are limited by language, a few bits per second, and they can have, uh, you know, huge bandwidth capacities, meaning they can synchronize each other almost if it was one big brain, right? So um, which we me, can't. We have culture to try to approximate that, but we, we can't do let that. Let me ask a, a sort of a, a further question here. You've kind of mentioned words like they are, they will be super smart and you know super intelligent, more smarter than us and more intelligent than us. Now, yeah. um, would it be smart or intelligent to you know hit that kind of nuclear button in a kind of mutually assured destructive scenario? In other words. If these machines really were smarter than us, could that yeah. not also kind of assurain a period of paradise and of like rational thinking, actually in a way kind of making up for all our human frailties and, and, and shortfalls? Or when you say smarter, do you mean more evil than us? What exactly do you no. mean by okay. smarter than us? Let me, let me, that's, that's a great question. Let me like uh, answer, try to, there are two separate things that are joined together in humans, but not in machines. And so one thing is pure like intellectual power, like understanding and then being able to infer what you should do or how to get to a place or, you know, in order to achieve some goals. So that's just intellectual power. And it's completely detached from what the goals are. We can't turn off our compassion instinct. It's been like hardwired into us, at least most of us, by evolution. For machines, it's just a few lines of code, right? And even a human operator, like if you think about, if you've been using chat GPT, you can, you can ask it questions and you could tell it to do it in a particular way. So you're actually giving it a kind of goal. Um, and so if the goals are nefarious, then it will be an evil machine if you want. If the goals are to protect humanity and help you know, fight disease and climate change, it should be great. However, there's another problem, which is very complicated. It's called the alignment problem. Uh, it's well known in economics. There was a recent Nobel Prize about it. And even if we give it what we think are good goals, it may still misbehave. 
And it has to do with the fact that it's almost impossible to state what we want in a compact way. It's like the three wishes of genies, right? Um, you think you ask for something good and you end up with something that could be harmful. Now, one, one last question, that's very, very interesting. Um, so what you're saying is, is that because AI systems are always partial, um, as in they have specific goals as opposed to universal yes. goals. Um, well, there's, there's no such thing as universal goals. No, like, right, you right. have goals, you know, I have goals. If and I, we don't even know what our goals are. Like uh, yeah. we think we can express them, but it's only like a partial specification. Well, if I would if I would specify, you know, assure world peace at all times, um, then yeah. that would be a universal goal. Or if I would no, but of, you didn't say that um, humans have to, you know, uh, survive the peace. You can have peace with everybody's dead, go. right? And then, <laughs> then already. you say, okay, add, add this clause, and I'll find another one where it's going to be bad for us. It's okay. it's a never ending problem and the way by the way this is kind of what some of the current systems are built they try to put down some specification of what we want the system how this system should behave and then they try it out and then they find some problems and they add some more pieces and, and of course the problem here so if i understand you correctly is is that if we now place that huge power um in sort of like say two polarized hands one in the For east, example. one in the west, or one in the north, or one in the south, or however we split up the planet, we may find ourselves in another sort of game theoretical self-destructive loop. Isn't isn't that For what sure. you're saying? And it's then going to be a question of whose AI is bigger, stronger, more powerful. Yeah. Um, and, and that's going to be the game then. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah, but there are about? other there are other dangerous games. So that's the AI arms race scenario. But there are other games where it's not even that you know countries are trying to um, dominate each other. Um, so first of all, companies can um, try to dominate each other, and they will, because of the commercial incentive and the survival pressure on them, they might not be always very careful. And if you're not careful with these very powerful systems that eventually will be smarter than us, you might end up in a situation where what we call loss of control so uh, i need to explain that concept what does that mean uh even if you give goals to the machine so i said that there may be a mismatch between how it behaves and what we intended um a kind of side effect of having a goal is that the machine will create sub goals implicitly or explicitly in order to achieve those goals so for and and the the sub goal that's most common sort of a side effect of almost any goal is survive. Um, in other words, to achieve my goal, I need to still be there to carry it to the end. Yeah. So now I have this extra goal, which means I don't want humans to turn me off. And if you remember or have seen and have seen the you know Space Odyssey two thousand one and the HAL nine thousand story. That's exactly what happens. Once the machine kind of gets paranoid that, oh, maybe somebody wants to turn me off, they're going to potentially, um, you know, they get into a conflict with humans, which ended badly in the story, of course. And, uh, and you're saying, and you're, to me, this sounds like pure science fiction. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a perfect no, it's not. Uh, plot, it's computer it? science. It's not science fiction. It's, it's uh, you know, peer-reviewed computer science and economics. Uh, you know, behind the, you know, the, 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 the game theoretical issue, if you want. Uh, so, really, so it's but, but how, uh, and, and at this point, I want to start to think about bringing John in on the conversation, uh, who has built an organization um, around this idea of countering what he calls uh, global uh, sort of destructive competition. Um, and he gives examples of first move for disadvantages that kind of trigger a kind of a race to the bottom, uh, similar to what, you know, for instance, an arms race would be or, or, or uh, indeed kind of an economic race uh, of sorts. Um, now, if you take, uh, for example, the arms, the kind of the Cold War arms race, nuclear arms race, um, regulating this was not easy, but it wasn't easy because of the power play. Uh, the actual specification of what needs regulating was actually quite straightforward. 
in, in UK, you know, so basically only built so many nuclear warheads, only do this and the other. It was yeah. quantifiable in a way that you didn't have to have yes. a PhD uh, in, in computing to understand. Now, what you said is saying is, is that we're looking at an unbounded problem which can shoot off in so many directions. How would you ever regulate this? Well, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I'm not like a legal expert. Um, but there are many things we can do to reduce the probability of catastrophes. So the most important one is think of, uh, you know, who has access to nuclear bombs? So who has access to very powerful AI systems? We want to limit that number. We want to make sure that, say, companies that have these systems don't share the, the code and, and, and the, the model parameters so that anybody out there can derive something dangerous from it. Um, so in that sense, it's similar to warheads. It's we really are saying, you know, these serial yeah. farms and what's basically in them, they need to be protected in the same way as a kind of, a, yeah. you know, like a, a, a silo with a nuclear warhead would have had to be protected. Yeah. You, need, you need licensing that's going to be very strict, uh, both for people and for organizations that build these things. Uh, and you need rules to make sure that uh, there's no leaks. I mean, and eventually there will be, but you know, at least you minimize the probabilities of those things. Um, so that's the access part. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then you have the um, problem of alignment. So I try to explain, you know, difference between intention and what you get. Um, and that requires a lot more investment in research. So it's not regulation, but we, it's like you know research on climate. If you're dealing with climate change. We need to understand better what can go wrong, um, and we are starting to understand that. So we know some things are more dangerous than others. So regulation. So for example, AI systems that have an uh, that have agency that can act in the world, for example, on the internet, are much more dangerous than AI systems that don't have even a notion of themselves acting in the world. Um, and that you, you can build systems that are like that. So they're more like tools rather than agents. Uh, and they are much safer. So so there are, there are various considerations like this that can already go into regulation if we were to do it tomorrow morning um, that have to do with that mismatch between what we want and what we get. Um, the third aspect of regulation comes in is the this intellectual power, right? So more intelligent systems are more dangerous, but but for example, you can have specialized systems that are very intelligent about biology or um, you know even a particular disease, and they're probably not very dangerous. Like they don't understand human psychology or how the world works or how to hire people to do things or what's organized crime. So so they're much less dangerous. So there are many um, factors here in uh, that can be controlled. So some systems again are more dangerous than others. Um, um, the amount of compute that you need to train them also is a factor. So we want to make sure if, if if somebody, you need a license to buy more than 10,000 GPUs, for example, or something like this, and you want to track who these people are uh, and making sure they follow the rules. Um, uh, the, the So the type of data, the amount of data that they use, so all of these can be factors that can be managed so that we reduce those risks. And then finally, the, the agency I mentioned. So is it, uh, what's the action space? Like, so if an AI is actually controlling nuclear weapons, like that's the worst scenario because it can directly create some something really dangerous. But if it's far removed from potentially very harmful actions, then it's easier. If it's only, if it doesn't have access to the internet, but it's kind of only interacting with humans, for example, then it has less of a, potential for harm, but of course it can convince people. So it's not a perfect you know, isolation, but you can see that different degrees of um, potentially harmful agency that can also be regulated. Absolutely, and of so course, what, I guess what yeah. you're saying is, is that this all has to operate within the dynamic frame of knowledge creation and reflection. So as we move forward, obviously, and more understanding yes. emerges, so, more knowledge emerges, exactly. we can And we, we can need adjust. to build, regulatory frameworks, both national and international that are gonna be highly adaptive because there's still a lot of things we don't understand. We're gonna be doing research and then some you know, people are gonna be playing with those systems and being careless or you know, malicious 
and we're going to figure out, oh, we need to have a new regulation to deal with that. And it, we're not going to have like three years to react. It's going to have to be very quick because, you know, you can have threats on democracy, for example, in coming elections. That's very plausible. And, you know, so it, it needs to be that in a matter of weeks, an organization like this can react and say this, you know, this is not allowed anymore. Absolutely. Joshua, what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring um, John in now and tell us a little bit about about the organization he founded in 2000, Simpol, the, uh, um, uh, to, to understand what, uh, first of all, to understand what Simpol is doing, how they operate and what they're, and what I would then like to do following that is to sort of experimentally, just us to knock our heads together a bit and see whether such an organization could play a role in moving forward some kind of regulatory uh, debate. Uh, John, um, over to you. Thank you very much for uh, coming in today as well and for um, all your patience. We have slightly overrun, but this has been so interesting listening to Shoshi about, about AI that uh, I was very happy to let it run. Uh, John, uh, please do tell us a little bit more about Simple, what its objectives are and how, how it actually works. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Nice to meet you, Joshua. Um, yeah, basically, Simple is, is, is a framework for uh, international cooperation, for widespread international cooperation. Because, and it's born out of the realization that we, we, we basically are living in a globalized economy where information, money, capital, investment moves at the click of a computer mouse uh, across national borders. And yet our governance systems are, are primarily national. Okay, and so there is a mismatch. There's a governance gap, and in a globe, you know, the, the economy, e economics, economic markets always move ahead of governance. Governance is always trying to play catch up with with uh, uh, with with economic uh, innovation and development. And we're now at a stage where there's a whole raft of problems that fall into this category of first mover competitive disadvantage, these game theoretical um, issues where, you know, we can talk about, for, for example, with AI, <clears throat> you know, you can talk about the threats, but then when you overlay on that, the international aspects that China is trying to get ahead of the states and vice versa, and, and you know, it's, it's a race to the bottom, as, as you just said. And, and what I'm trying to aliven people to is that there's a whole raft of these issues now, and we need a, a, a comprehensive framework to deal with all of them. And that's what Simpol tries to outline uh, and to put into practice. Um, now, I, before, before I start, let me just say that I think I do agree with Joshua. I think that the problem of AI is so urgent that I don't think it can wait for simple, right? I think there probably needs to be something done much more quickly on that. However, I, I think that you know, the, the point that I want to get across to people is that we have to wake up, that there is a whole raft of these issues. There is AI, there is climate change, there is nuclear weapons, there is financial market regulation, there is um, you know, the, the, the way the banks create money out of nothing. You know, there, are, there are 20 really Taxation. huge- Sorry, taxation. taxation. Yeah, and yeah, you know, corporate, corporate uh, tax avoidance, tax, tax evasion. All of these things. You know, there, there's a whole raft of issues. And in fact, what is what is uh, you, you know the, the lack of governance in, in in that space is that the poison from that lack of governance trickles down to the national level, the local level. If we don't fix the the, the global level everything is going to, to collapse. And, and so, <clears throat> but as I said, I think AI is so urgent, it may well need and it may well galvanize something much more quickly. So we, we, it may not be that relevant to Simpol. Nevertheless, let me explain what, what Simpol is based on. So the, Simpol is actually short for simultaneous policy. The idea is that if all or sufficient nations act together simultaneously, then no nation loses out. Um, corporations have nowhere to, to run. You get global coverage, but you don't need a global government. You just need very coordinated international cooperation with simultaneous implementation. So that's the first point. 
The second point <clears throat> is that Simpol would be based on a multi-issue agreement. I think one of the problems we have today, for example, with climate change, is that we're just trying to deal with one issue at a time. If you take any single issue, you will always get some nations that win on that issue, other nations that lose on that issue, and the losers, of course, have no incentive to cooperate. But if you had a multi-issue package, you have the opportunity for trade-offs. So just very, you know, and I, I acknowledge this is far easier said than done, but if, for example, nations were to agree a currency transactions tax, a global currency transactions tax, simultaneously implemented. <clears throat> this is not a new idea. It's been around for, it's called, sometimes called a Tobin tax. Um, the, the, the proceeds from that tax, or some of the proceeds from that tax, could be used to compensate the, the loser nations on a climate agreement. So the idea is to make, is to make it in every nation's self-interest to cooperate, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, the third aspect of Simpol is the most unique, and that is the bottom-up aspect, where you, you know, it's all very well talking about nations having, making a simultaneous agreement, but how are we gonna drive them to get there? And that's where citizens come in. So Simpol is actually an associa association of citizens who basically say, declare that they will give strong preference at all future national elections to politicians who've signed a pledge to implement the simultaneous policy, okay? So we are, we are, we are uh, basically saying, you know, we, we, we may or may not have a party preference, but we are going to give preference to politicians who sign the pledge, doesn't matter what party. And that declaration means that we don't need a majority of citizens to drive politicians to sign that pledge, because, you know, many, parliamentary seats and even entire elections are won and lost on relatively fine margins. And so uh, to date, we actually have over 100 members of parliament of the UK parliament who've signed the pledge. They come from all the main UK parties. Uh, in Germany, I think we've got about 40 uh, members of the Deutsche Bundestag who've signed in, in the Irish parliament, about 12 or 15. And then we have a few members of parliament in other parliaments around the world who've signed up. So <clears throat> this is really a way that citizens can drive the political process in different nation states towards this goal. And that ability to, 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 to incentivize politicians um, is also means that citizens can have a very strong influence over the policies that are to be contained within Simpol, right? So this isn't a matter of leaving it up to governments to, uh, with their corporate influences to decide. We citizens can have a very powerful influence because ultimately they depend on our votes, right? Now, obviously the, the first question that arises, okay, well, that's fine for democratic countries, but what about China? What about uh, non-democratic countries? So <clears throat> my suggestion there is that the, the simple framework, as I've described it, means that for any nation, they, they've got nothing to lose by participating in the process and everything to gain. And non-democratic countries need solutions to global problems too. So I think you know the the absence of this governance framework means that the the crisis level is going to keep rising and rising and rising. So that whether you're a democratic country or a non-democratic country, sooner or later the incentive to to cooperate to solve the problem is 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 going to be absolutely sort of irresistible because the alternative will be you know that we all go under. So um, there's now of course no guarantees to this. Uh, and anyone who expects guarantees really is a bit naive and ought to grow up, I would say. But so what, what Simple is trying to do is to aliven people to this need for a, a cooperative framework to deal with all of these kind of issues. Because, you know, it, it, they keep popping up and they will continue to pop up all the while that this framework is not in place. Now, 
the 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 we've been I've been at this for 20 years, Nico, and we, you and I we we've spoken about this before. And the, the biggest barrier to this, I mean, the, the big the big paradox with Simple is actually politicians are much more supportive of Simple than citizens are, funnily enough. But I think that's because politicians understand the dilemma that they're in much more than citizens do or, or NGOs. But uh, my hope is that, you know, with time and through uh, 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 channels like yours, we will enliven citizens to this need. And Simpol is, is a very good tool for driving this process up the political agenda, driving politicians to sign up and eventually moving towards uh, a series of multi-issue cooperative simultaneous policies implemented simultaneously. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, it sounds like a utopian idea, but what I say to people is it's, it's not utopian. If you think it's utopian, it's just because your thinking is, is still lagging behind the reality. You know, the problems exactly as Joshua has, has described are right here, right now. You know, so if you still think this kind of thing is utopian, it's you that needs to catch up, you know. Anyhow, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, as I say, I, 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 think, um, I think AI is, is from, from what I understand, uh, Joshua, mainly from, from talk, listening to you now, but also in uh, some previous um, videos I've seen, it's probably so urgent that it needs, it needs its own Im more immediate agreement. But wow. um, I really hope that, if, you know, that, that also people will not forget that there's a whole load of issues out there yeah. that need this kind of simple framework. Um, so the timeline is complicated because there's a lot of uncertainty about it. As I mentioned, it could be that we bridge that gap in just a few years, let's say three to five years, or it could be it's going to take two decades. Um, and, and that's just my opinion. You know, other scientists have a different opinion. But but uh, there's yeah the, the the kind of numbers I give here a lot of people think are reasonable a lot of people who are experts uh, but nonetheless there's a big gap between say four and twenty and um, so you end up with having to jointly prepare for all of those cases um, and um, it, it's difficult and. Governments don't move very quickly, uh, and they have. Hard, I mean, climate in a way is easier because we have physics models that you know how things could you know to project ourselves in the future. Whereas for AI, we can't run simulations of entities smarter than us. Well, in some, yes, that, in, in some sense, though, that that might be an advantage, Joshua, because I think you know, in, in a certain sense, like like Nico was saying earlier, it's kind of like science fiction, and that scares people. And so that, yeah, that it could also be dangerous. may actually be a benefit for spurring quicker cooperation. Maybe. Maybe. There are people who are also afraid of uh, an AI panic, uh, which could you know, bring to power authoritarian governments. Um, that, that we have to be very careful. Mm. Um, what, what, I had a question for you, John. So mm -hmm. I like, I like the, the ideas of simple. Uh, I think something like this is needed, but I wonder what your thoughts are about the, you know, it, even if you get a lot of parliamentaries on board, uh, they might still have different opinions about what we should do about the problem. And you talk about, you know, international cooperation and negotiation. Well, can you elaborate on that? Because there will be divergences and in the eye, there already are, even among the scientists, <clears throat> yeah. not to mention the politicians. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe AI can help us, <laughs> but um yeah, I mean, if you if you if you go onto our website, there's a um, there's an information pack which gives a, a more of a breakdown of the, of the sort of process of policy development that that we would envisage. Um, and I'm not I'm not an expert, um, but I would envisage that you know for AI, for climate, for financial markets, you would have. Um, groups of experts that would advise Simpol supporters as to, you know, you, you yourself just outlined 
um, some headlines for how, you know, what, what one might do to regulate AI. Right. Um, and gradually we could incorporate that into our, you see at the moment, if you go onto our website, we list just a list of issues like climate, AI, blah, blah, blah. But gradually as time goes on and our su support grows, we would gradually define what would be mm -hmm. required in each of those areas. Right, right. And, and, and deliberate. But that, but that may be a place where the, the, the different parliamentary parliamentarians might kind of disagree, right? So you have to engage into a process of uh, agreeing on something. Well, yeah, we would, we we would, and obviously, you know, th th there will be divergences, and and I don't. I mean, the short answer is, Joshua, I don't know the answer to your question. What I do know is that as the water level, uh, you know, the pressure gets higher yeah. and higher, the pressure for agreement gets higher and higher. That's right. You know, and I mean, and in uh, a way, that's how that's how cooperation has always worked. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> maybe if I uh, briefly come in here, I mean, I think. There are quite, um, there's a lot of experience on how to design participatory processes for complex multi, uh, sort of, um, sort of multi governance uh, decisions. I yeah. mean, the, I mean, for example, within the context of constitutional conventions, but also in other areas. So, so my sense would be that um, what you would have to do to make this work is almost put a, a first rough first draft. Um, mm -hmm in well, uh, which would yeah, come I mean, from a, a leader like the US or you know whatever yeah. and really? that would have sort of debating points along the way where you could almost like a, a menu where you could then kind of fine tune and you could in a modular modular way you could replace or add uh, a different components to that I think that that's the process so because I think what uh, in my understanding of simple what simple really works well for is the point when you actually come to a decision. Um, I think the lead up to decision, whether this is actually developed collaboratively within a simple uh, framework or whether this is put forward by, say, for example, the US or uh, another kind of AI leader as, as a proposal to simple and then other governments, mm. other nations yeah. come on board and say, yeah, we would like to uh, kind yes. of have a say in that process. I think yeah. that's probably how I would uh, see uh, see this work. Yeah, yes, exactly. I mean, what you will see in the information pack is just our, our outline, outline, outline proposal of how a policy development process could work. Um, but it's, it's not written in stone. And as you say, Nika, there could be all sorts of other you know, this has to be a, a collaborative effort. Um, but what, you know, one thing, for example, that I, I, I that we we would love to do would be to actually get a, a proper university study uh, done on on the you know the 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 feasibility of, of bringing together a a robust climate agreement and a and a uh, currency transactions tax. Um, you know, to see you know well how high would the tax need to be. Uh, in order to produce sufficient funds to compensate people on on uh, nations on the climate part of the agreement, what could be two or three different distribution scenarios of those funds, and so forth. And and then I think you know one could work towards a, a simple one, you know, a, a, an initial agreement that 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 is deals with with urgent problems, but but also proves the process. And I think if that is successful. Then people will see the the value in it, and then they say, "Oh, wow! What else can we do with this? You know, oh yeah, we could. You know, what other policies could we pair up together? Uh, or there might be two two or more policies to to produce package number two, package number three, which could also incorporate re, um, uh, amendments to previous packages, because obviously, you know, things can there can be unintended consequences." There needs to be a rolling process of, of continuous improvement and, and sort of repair and, and, and uh, innovation and so on. And, and as Joshua says, you know, technology is moving all the time. So in some cases, there might need to be, you know, a series of AI simples, you know, that, that keep up with the, with the technological developments as, as they move. Um, but again, you know, my, my main purpose, you know, I, I'm just a, really a, a, a businessman who had a, a crazy idea. I'm not an expert on, the, on any of this. My, my purpose really is to lay out the framework. You know, it's how do you make it in the self-interest of nations to cooperate? That's, yeah. that's what Simpol does. How do you align 
the global interest with the national interest? How do you the, the, John, there's a those onto each other? And how do you allow citizens to drive that process by using established dem democratic processes? And Simpol ticks all of those boxes. We've proved it works. You know, in, in some, in, in, in a number of elections, <clears throat> we've had a, a, an experience where, particularly in tightly contested seats, uh, parliamentary seats, once one candidate signs the pledge, the others are kind of forced to follow, right? So we, there's a kind of domino effect. So we, we end up with all the, all the competing candidates having signed the pledge, even though the election hasn't take, it doesn't, hasn't, you know, only takes place in two weeks time. You know, so we, whoever wins, we win. You know, so it's a completely new way of doing politics at the global level. And it doesn't stop you from voting necessarily from voting for your preferred party. So it's a bit like having two votes because you make your declaration of giving preference to politicians that sign the pledge that operates in advance of the election, right? And, and that drives politicians to pledge in advance of the election. But then on election day, you get your vote like everybody else. So you're kind of getting a global vote and a national vote rolled into one. Okay. What's interesting, uh, uh, if, if, if you compare, like say the, 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 the climate, global sort of climate issue with the uh, AI, is what you will find is that on the climate side, um, th there's a lot of arguments that say really most countries or all countries should be involved in the decision because if they are not actually causing climate change, they'll be at the receiving end. Uh, with AI, I think it's somewhat different. If you had the sort of the G20 uh, involved to agree with us, the, 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 the rest of the nations would have would not have the economic or the kind of science yeah. base to actually yeah, right. ever produce uh, yeah, like yeah. an AI yeah. that would be yeah. dangerous. So it's the same the same countries are causing the problem that um could also fix it uh in the case of ai yeah uh, but but there are all these countries that would you know get the get harm as well if if uh, the the rich ones don't get their act together yeah no, no, that, that's right no, that's right but they would there would be beneficiaries of a deal but it's a bit like you know the nuclear arms deal there was no reason to rope in nigeria because you know that's nobody right. really ever thought that they would have a nuclear yeah, yeah. weapon um, in fact mostly we need the us and china yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's right, and possibly Europe. So that, that, that's why that's why in Simpol we say all or sufficient nations, and the, the the word sufficient depends on the policy package. You know, for for nuclear weapons, for example, it might just be those nations that have them or are suspected of having them. You know, for for um, you know corporate tax evasion. It, it might need to be virtually all countries, you know. So depend, you know. So it's flexible. You know, it's, this is a flexible uh, thing. It depends on on the policy that we're talking about or the package of policies that we're talking about. But I think also that's, you know, this 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 idea that there are some nations that will win on a particular policy and others that lose. That's why we need to to bring yeah. two or more issues together so that we can create the possibility for trade offs. Because if you don't have that. You know, you get you get what we're getting with climate change, which is like COP 350, where, you know, we're still blathering on about it and nothing's really getting done. Yeah. But Nick, actually, uh, if the cost of computing continues to decrease, it could be like in five or 10 years, then it becomes affordable for almost any country to enter into that race. And so- Oh right no, but you could obviously, you could guard, guard with that, but basically kind of lowering the point at which like say like GDP per head or whatever you would say to see as a kind of as a level at which they would have to join the agreement if right. they want to stay right. part of the international community. I mean, you could, in a way you could have a sort of a, a way of structuring it that they only have to come under the umbrella if they reach a certain kind of level of economic development. Uh, but but no, you're right, of course, that over time, the risk increases. I mean, it's a bit like with the pro proliferation of, of, of arms. I mean, over time, you, you really do have to worry about many kind of rook sta states of, of obtaining nuclear arms. Maybe 20 years ago, that wasn't so much of an issue. Um, and, and absolutely, I think there, there, there is that. But um, in terms of... I think in many, in many, in many cases, Nick, you, you will have a situation where at first glance, many countries will be irrelevant to the agreement. However, I think it, it's important that they sign up, or it could be important that they sign up, even just to you know, uh, say, well, if it happens, we're subject to it, 
and also so that that a corporation knows that it can't just move to that country yes. Uh, yes. to ev avoid the, um, the, the, the the regulation. Rules. You know, so you know, whichever way you look at it, and this is this is what I'm trying to say to people: whichever way you try and dice and slice this, we need global cooperation. You know, and and there's no getting around it. Um, you know, so. Um, and and, and I, I say again, we, we don't, either, God forbid, we don't want a world government. And, you know, but, but something like Simpol would, would be to my, as far as I can see, the, the perfect way to get that global coverage without, um, uh, you know, without having, uh, you know, this sort of huge bureaucracy of, of, of a world government. And also, let me also say that there's a very specific criteria for um, whether or how a policy qualifies for inclusion in Simpol or not. And so to any policy proposal, we apply a test, and that test is, would the unilateral implementation of that policy by a single nation or by a restricted group of nations like the EU be likely to cause it a significant competitive disadvantage, yes or no? Now, if the, so if the, if the answer to that is, no, it wouldn't cause it a, a, a disadvantage, then it's a national policy. It has nothing to do with simple. Okay, so that's, that enforces and, and safeguards the principle of national sovereignty. Okay, but for where the answer is, yes, it would cause a competitive yeah. disadvantage, then it falls into the simple category. And, and in the case of AI, yeah, it so, would. So in a sense, it's a... an extension of national sovereignty because it's bringing... Yeah collectively to nation states the power to deal with issues which they cannot deal with today yeah. i mean so if you take AI, I mean, innovation you... innovation is is the sort of the benefit of not putting regulation or reducing it there, there, there's an interesting so, example sorry, sorry, in the, 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 the european union and, and the common market i mean it, it very quickly it was very hard to actually kind of get it going in the first place but once it existed everybody wanted to be a part of it because it was a except maybe now for the UK, but I mean, I think there's plenty in the UK who regret it too, that they've left. But everybody else, I don't think, wants to actually leave the, the common market, because it's a massive advantage to be part of it, and people can see it. And I think if, for example, if there was a an agreement, a regulatory framework that would include an element of, you know, knowledge transfer, technology sharing, or whatever, you know, smaller countries who would be at risk of becoming rook states would have a great interest because they would gain access to that technology yeah. by coming under the umbrella. So I think one could structure it in such a way that it sucks in smaller countries who would massively benefit at that point to being part of it. If you would get, as you said, initially, like the US and China on, on the table to, to right. have the initial agreement, everything else I think would follow probably from there. Yeah. Um, now, the, the one thing, I think one of the big disadvantages, one of the big problems Simpol faces is, is that it's a, an abstract idea that doesn't really get people so excited. Another example is proportional representation. I mean, there's been, you know, in the UK, people have been kind of campaigning for this for years. You've never won an election. On it. Of course, it would be of great benefit to many smaller parties and all the rest, but it's abstract. Voters don't really aren't motivated by that. And I think Simpol has a similar abstract problem so but if it was linked to a actual issue like ai it could come to life and so mm. my my question is is it's chicken and egg isn't it it's like i mean john is convinced that this needs to grow to a certain size before it can become operational i kind of wonder whether by kind of if you like sort of front loading it like through a strategic exercise a smaller like a, a proof of concept initiative um, whether this could light up people's imagination of what this kind of framework could do, not just for AI, but possibly also for other similar uh, game theoretical right. kind of uh, problems. H how do you see that, uh, 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 Sosia? Do you think there's something in that, or how would you, having listened to to John, what, it, it's how would you square that circle? It makes sense to me, but I'm just a computer scientist, you know. Uh, so it sounds right. Um, um, I think that the the scale of damage in the case of AI might be the thing that can bring, you know, um, countries to the table, um, like even countries that are in strong opposition. Just like after the Second World War, the fear of Armageddon, nuclear Armageddon, you know, brought people to the table. Um, so 
that 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 might be um, something that can accelerate the process of uh, bringing more countries to the table. Because um, the, 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 the gains, the gains, you know, are clear. But but if we lose everything, then it's not a good game. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, what, what, what in practical terms are you doing to drive the AI regulation forward? I mean, I understand, so I think there, there was a, a, there are, a letter uh, that, that many people signed, wasn't there? Yeah, so, yeah, well, but there are discussions going on right now and taking place uh, around the world um, in different countries. Um, so I'm going to be principal at uh, in Washington uh, witnessing to the Senate about the AI risks and regulation uh, next week and um, there are international discussions going on right now various groups proposing international institutions to try to you know create that cooperation and um, and and the funding for the research that's needed because that's a big part of the problem. Like there's a lot of unknown that we need to invest. Basically, for each dollar that we're currently investing in making AI smarter, we need at least the same amount to make it safer. And right now, it's like a hundred to one. You know, Joshua, what I'm thinking is, is like I, you just mentioned that there needs to be an institution that deals with this. And I kind of, I'm being a very pra practical kind of person. I'm, I'm thinking, well, here we have got simple, which is quite generic in terms of what it can do. It's almost like a white label service offering. You know, you could, and it comes with quite a significant political backing already, hundreds of parliamentarians around the world. Um, yeah. Now, over I just wonder. Hundreds. <laughs> well, well, a hundred in in the UK, forty in Germany, and you know, a couple of sprinkled around the world. But it's 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 a lot more than nothing. It's and it also is an idea that has matured over the last twenty years. Um, I wonder. I, this is just a kind of a thought. Um, if this was used as a as a wide label product, if you like, I said to say, well, okay, why don't we? use that and build an institution around that to see whether it works what would speak against that well you need to get the us and china first to agree uh, but actually i think what's going to happen is more like um g7 or the oecd um like democratic countries are going to be able to sit together and come up with some agreements um but but that that's the place where something like simple could play. Um, then we need to get China around the table. So I already part of discussions to try to bring Chinese you, and do you think, uh, Western sure people that... to kind of discuss these questions. It's just the the discussion is just starting, right? But it's it's going to take a while. Do you, do you think that there might be some value in having? something like simple which isn't attached to any nation state so it's a neutral third party as it were a, a kind of broker between between the parties or a, or, or a, like like nico says a white label because i think you know any almost anything that comes from the g7 or from china or from any nation state is sort of al almost automatically tainted by the hidden hand of national right. self-interest you know yeah, but but simple is based on, um, I mean, it, it works around the democracies, and right now, if I understand, it's just uh, you know a very well, small number it, of countries, well, it, it's, and not it's, the U.S. Right, so I think the U.S. is the biggest thing. So we yeah. need for this to work somehow jointly. We need to get something like simple involved in the U.S. and where politics is very complicated, as you know. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that the fear of you know AI catastrophes is going to bring uh, Republicans and Democrats together, but we'll see. Yeah, um, I think I think if you I, I you know from, from, a, from trying to be as realistic as I can, I think if you could um, perhaps after this show, I, I'll, if I may, I, I'll just send you a brief that that information sure. pack, which would give you a, a brief outline. Um, also, uh, and if you could just bear it in mind, Joshua, because yes, I think there may absolutely. come a time in, in these negotiations yes. where some kind of common understanding of a common neutral framework is needed. 
yeah. that that isn't real that it doesn't come from any particular nation state but has the has the capacity to accommodate all nation states yeah also joshua i think this needs to be clarified because i think uh, uh, john is very specific on that and i think there's a misunderstanding here um this isn't just targeted at democratic nations uh, simple doesn't distinguish between you know sort of authoritarian or whatever so if you were to use simple the simple framework say in the context of china and the us then you right. could easily have Chinese officials sign up to the simple pledge in the same way as you would have, you know, German or British or yeah. Canadian parliamentarians sign up to it. Yeah. Um, the, the issue here is, is that somebody yeah. in China will make the laws, and if they sign up, doesn't matter whether they're democratically elected or not, they would be putting their name to the pledge. And I think that is the key issue here, not whether this has a democratic mandate behind it. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, so basically, in, in in democratic countries, it would be the simple supporters via their sim their simple national simple organizations together with experts who have the primary primary power in terms of policy development right <clears throat> but in non democratic countries it would be the government those governments and of course eventually there then needs to be a negotiation between all of them to see if something can be thrashed out but anyway that all of that is you know the, the, the point that Nico's making is that that simple is it's not really it's not about necessarily it primarily about democracy it's primarily about international cooperation regardless right, of right. how we get there yeah and the, the 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 document I'll send you will will clarify that I think no but I I think the the general idea of simultaneous implementation and uh, potentially linking multiple issues um, that that you you presented, um, John, is something that could be very important here. Um, so so thanks for you know uh, explaining all these things to me. Yeah, well, well I very much appreciate you in having the opportunity, and uh, thank you, Nico. Thank you, but thank you, Joshua, for that. Yeah, well, thank you both for, I think this is a very good point to wrap up. Um, thank you both very much for coming. I think this has been, I mean, what we've seen here is, is that there is a, a very, very complex, multi-layered, multi-dimensional, multi-perspectival problem, which for a lay person like myself is very hard to actually, to, to somehow to capture. But you know, in the hands of somebody like Russia, it all of, all of a sudden becomes manageable. So I think there is clearly, I think one of the points you made very forcefully is that there needs to be more research, which obviously is about generating more knowledge, but also about communicating that knowledge in a very simple and understandable way to policymakers so that it does become yeah. a sort of a, something that can be regulated uh, and understood. Um, so, uh, and of course, but bringing that together with a very sort of like real world pragmatic and um, approach and project uh, of, of the kind that John has developed the last 20 years, uh, you can see how obviously, you know, it's a bit like kind of trying to implant something into an organism, it'll initially be rejected until it kind of finds a way of sort of coming together, uh, if it ever is. Uh, but, I, but I think it's, it's very interesting to see that there is this policy environment out there on the one hand and then there's a set of the set of issues on the other and somehow to bring those two together can be a really really definitely a very difficult uh, task indeed so, but Georgia, i think you had a very very interesting uh, sort of place here um you've got a very important role to play and and hopefully i wish you a good hand with the senate and next uh, next week i think um I, I just hope they're all going to listen to you the, you know as attentively as as john and i have because I think they will learn an awful lot, and hopefully um, we will be able to find a way forward in this in this very difficult in this very difficult area. Thank you both. Thank you ever so much, and um, best of luck. Thanks for coming on to Reboot Twenty Thirty today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Thanks, Joshua. Bye. Bye.